Hi, precious ones. It's the Sunday after Easter, and I'm back. I want to kind of break down what I said Easter Sunday, or no, last Wednesday, excuse me, about what these steps are for us to operate awake and not succumb to the puppet masters. And to me, this is the most important thing we can know right now is that we are okay. I even bought a copy of the 1973 no book, I'm Okay, You're Okay, because I think there's a whole lot of people out there that just want you to not be okay. And I don't think there's a whole lot of you that disagree with me that every one of us have something. And this past year has revealed that thing. When we had to be at home and spend more time with our families and homeschool our children and we're just here. And as we awakened and found out something's just fishy, something just doesn't add up. Well, what do we do with that knowledge? Because as soon as we start buying into that knowledge, believe me, there's a whole school of thought on the other side of the equation that will try to pull your strings just as much as the other one that you awakened from. So where do we go from here? And I proposed several steps that were an acrostic of the word awaken and in doing so, I think it's time that we broke them down even further. So today I want to talk about that first step of acknowledge you don't understand God and consider, just consider, that he might be good and much bigger than you think he is. So that's where I'm at. And in order to go through this, there's several scriptures I kind of want to talk about, as well as the AA Steps 1 and 2, Celebrate Recovery Steps 1 and 2, and Principles 1 and 2 for both programs, and also, well, and Richard Rohr's book is what it is. Uh, it goes through the Alcoholics Anonymous steps but even AA is now split up into lots of different things and now we have celebrate recovery that is bible based but the concepts are the same step one is we admit we are powerless over what we're powerless over which at this moment in time is everything we all learned in March of last year that we could either work from home or we could live under unemployed and that gave us a whole lot more time to watch the news and all that goes into that so the second step though and I think a lot of time and effort in a lot of different programs have spent a lot of time on step one all these programs you go into the meetings and you say, hey, hello, my name is Linda, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm an overeater. I'm a codependent. Um, I'm the mother of a drug addict. And in Celebrate Recovery, they some, say something very similar and confess their addiction or hurts, habits, or hangups is their thing. So each, each time you meet, you confess what that is. And I don't know, I've never been really big on that concept because I think when we get free of it, we need to leave it back there and not bring it up every Thursday. But again, another subject for another day. So I want to focus on step two. Step two for Alcoholics Anonymous is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Okay, we admitted the world's crazy. Okay, so step one's over. I don't think many of us are in denial at this point. So we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And step two in Celebrate Recoveries, we came to believe is exactly the same. 
um, that we earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has power to help me recover. Earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. That's where I want to sit. Last week we talked about acknowledging that we're not God and that we're not going to get it. We can't put him in our box. He's bigger. It's bigger. I'll tell you a story when I went to celebrate recovery. I had been reading the book of Job because my life just seemed like Job. <laughs> Even down to the fact that at that time I had a rash on my arms. I mean, it, it was crazy. And I read the first time I read the book of Job, I read it through and I said, okay, God, seriously, that's it. I'm God and you're not. Now you're blessed. That's all I got to learn. That was quite underwhelming to say the least. And I told that story to several people over the course of several months. And then I went to celebrate recovery. And when I went to celebrate recovery, principle one to coincide with step one and two or step one is realize I'm not God. I saw that and went, Oh, okay. Maybe we are acting like we're God. And there is something in that concept of the many chapters in Job where God says, where were you when I, where, do you know where the wind or originated? Can you go there? Can you make that happen? It's, it's pretty, you know, pretty solid stuff to read in the way that God demonstrated that Job was not God. And he couldn't understand God. Things are happening and you don't get it. But that's okay because I am your father and I live in you and I do know. So, okay. Again, like I said in other videos, you know, a lot of us have had bad examples come out of religion. No matter what religion. And it it's a shame that a lot of people are limited by other people putting God in a box or preaching from a place in their self that is maintaining their revenue stream rather than for God's glory. A lot of people can't handle the glory and therefore they're not preaching from that place anymore. One of my favorite verses in the world that I quoted it on Wednesday and I wanted to make sure I put in the description below. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 in the American Standard Version. And God is able to make all grace overflow to you. That always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. People talk about God's grace and God's mercy like they're interchangeable words. I believe that the grace of God is that power that he gives us to do the next right thing. And so in order to do this thing, to start the 12-step journey, yes, you can't be in denial anymore. But the second part is, the second step is, a lot of times just as hard because we don't really talk about who our higher power is and how can we trust something that we don't know is good. Step two is changing your focus from where you're at to what you're turning to and you choose. 
You choose what your higher power is. And the two principles in AA are surrender and hope. Surrender and hope. If you don't know that this guy is good or this entity, this God of yours is going to keep have your best interest in mind, how can you do that stuff? You can't surrender to a God you think is evil and mean. It's not possible. You can go through the steps, but you can't truly be free. And I, I've always believed that the 12 steps are just a really good way to live. And living surrendered in the hope for the future is, I believe, the way you do that. The rest of the steps talk about how you can get freer, but it starts with getting out of denial and then choosing to believe. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, could make us better. So we focus on who we're turning to. And that needs to be discovered by our innermost, innermost being before we can even begin to heal. Because until we can surrender to the hope of a future, we're holding on to all of it, every trauma, physical, emotional, religious, what everybody did, it's all still there. And in the Bible, Jesus was really clear. You forgive or you're not forgiven. It was really, really important to Jesus that we forgive. It was also important that we ask for forgiveness. But there's nowhere in the forgive statements and scriptures, and I'll go into greater detail if you want to, but there's nowhere in there that says they have to ask for forgiveness or they have to apologize because the forgiveness is about your freedom. It's not about them. And it certainly doesn't mean you expose yourself to them again. So when we as victims of trauma have created ways to survive through the years, at least me, I ended up, I continued smoking. I ended up using food as a comfort and several other not good, mostly dietary things, Diet Dr. Pepper, other things that, that just really messed my body up. And I had to realize when I went on my journey last month in the middle of Lent that the message God gave me when I left my first husband, I need to hear it again. And I kind of should have been living it the whole time, all 25 years now that I've been abusing my body. I mean, what we do, when we do that, when I was doing that, I just picked up where he left off. And kept proving him right. You think he's affected by my overweight, diabetic, chronic pain situation? No, I hurt myself, not him. So in the wilderness I've been in, in the last 10 years, I've learned to know God. And I tell you, he's bigger. He's bigger than anything anybody ever told me. Anything I've ever gotten out of anything. Being in communion, constant communication with God Almighty, the creator of the universe, is a high no drug can, no drug can talk. I'm not saying there's no bad days. There are. But when you look and you live and you ask and you 
be in the presence of the creator of the universe, the rest of it looks different. It's less scary. It's not scary at all, actually. And it just, just can't win. And no, I don't understand any of it. But I've learned that the fact that I really don't want to be able to understand every all of it. God will give me what I need to, to do my purpose in life. And that's my job. The rest of it's his. It's not mine to judge what he told you or what you think is right. But let's just park here on is God good? Because if we can't trust that God is good, how can anyone expect, expect us to surrender to him? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Anybody that spent any time in the Baptist church knows this scripture. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what good will it do a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? Or what will a person give in exchange for his soul? So this was Matthew 16. And in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, this is another one that I honestly have never really read the whole section. Everybody says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So in Matthew 11, verse 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is comfortable. This is the American Standard Bible. Most of the ones I've heard is my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So let's take the first one. There's a meme that I put as the thumbnail for this video. And it's a picture of Jesus with a big old te teddy bear behind his back. And this little girl, this is no, I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it up. And he says, please. Because he wants to give her a bigger one. Everything we're holding on to, like trying to hold on to it to save our lives what he has is better and the scripture come to me all who are weary and burdened for my yoke is comfortable it's easy and my yoke is light well many many years I just thought this was somehow a scripture that didn't apply to me because my life was hard and bad things kept happening to me, no matter how good I was. Until I received an image from the creator of this little girl trying to hold her box. It's so heavy when she's carrying it to her daddy. And she's so proud of herself to be able to carry it. And then her daddy swoops in and picks her up. And all of a sudden, she's all happy. She's not struggling anymore because the weight of that box is now being held, held by the person holding her. He says, I want to hold you and your burdens. When you yoke yourself to me, the things we're going to do together. I was reading in chapter six of the shack a month ago. When the 
title is called the God is a verb. And one of the things they talked about is how we as humans have taken ourselves out of relationship and made the verb or the situation of living in expectancy. We're just expecting for God to do something amazing. We don't know what it is, but oh, we're watching for it. And we're going to thank him every time we see it. It's living in expectancy. And we turn it into an expectation. And when there's all these expectations on us, oh, geez, the weight is so heavy. So let's live in expectancy today. So I challenge you. As we finish this video, I challenge you to question. All I want you to do <coughs> is acknowledge. Acknowledge the possibility that God might be bigger than anything we can understand. And anything negative that you've seen or heard or anything about God might not be true. And consider the possibility that he's good. So what do we do with this information, right? Ask him to show you. So scripture in Psalms says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Ask him to show you. Ask him to reveal himself to you. And then sit and listen. Wait on the Lord. He will talk. He is talking. We have to train our ears to hear. And most of the time we're so busy thinking about the next thing we're gonna do, we can't hear anything. Because the hearing isn't happening on the external. It's an internal knowing. And I mean, I've gone through years where I didn't hear anything. I don't think God stopped talking. I think I stopped listening. So let's enter in with God. And I pray today. I lift everyone up that will ever see this video. And I pray that you will know the power. You will have the power. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit <coughs> will allow you to understand the height and the depth and the breadth of his love and his goodwill towards you. You guys have a wonderful day and I'll see you on the next one.